What's up, church? How are we doing today? How about them Chicago Bears showing a pulse? Signs of one per. Yeah, they won a game. First one feels like 20 years. Who cares? I get it. I get it. Let us have one thing, all right, people? One thing. It's the first win in forever. We got to cheer and celebrate because Chicago sports, man, it's lean times out there for us Chicago sports fans. But that's all besides the point. We are starting a brand new series, as Logan and Tyler talked about. It's called Jim's Jim. It's all a study on the book of James. And if the book of James were to have a slogan, it would be how to have or have an act of faith. You ever notice how we are suckers for a good slogan? Just the other day, my kids were singing the Burger King slogan, like in the car or at the house. I'm like, where did this come from? They were singing, BK have it your way, you rule. It was really kind of weird because I'm like, I don't think they've ever been to Burger King. And if they had been to Burger King, they would be really disappointed. If they were to have it their way, they would have picked somewhere else because Burger King is absolutely terrible. But it's amazing how all slogans get ingrained in our head. We know what they are for products that we may or may not even buy. So for example, Nike is... Come on, I need you to look alive out there, people. Now, I need a little something. You've already had like lots of coffee. You've slept in. It's the 11 o'clock service, so give me a little energy. Nike is? Yes. Hey, there it is. Or buy our stuff and act like you just did it. McDonald's, da-da-da-da-da. I'm loving it. Until about 30 minutes later, you're not going to love it too much anymore. Wheaties, the breakfast of? If little, like, thin, tiny pieces of cardboard is what you're into, Red Bull will give you... Wings, if you call a racing heart and jitters, wings. But think about any slogan. That's what they do. They sell you on a promise. They make grand promises to you. They tell you, hey, this product will change your life or it'll make you happy. And many times we buy into the promise, but there's a website called honestslogans.com. Really hilarious. I encourage you to go look at it later. But here's a few slogans if the companies were being honest about what they were trying to sell you. So Chick-fil-A, you'll always crave it on Sunday. <laughs> That's so true, man. You're going to leave church today. After you drive out of here, you're going to go right by Lowe's and Chick-fil-A, and you're going to be like, why? I want them chicken nuggets in my tummy right now. But you can't have it because they're closed. Or hamburger helper. Mom's tired. <laughs> She's just mailing it in. You're going to get what you get, and you can't throw a fit. It is what it is. Ikea. We throw in extra parts just to mess with you really true. And then that little itty bitty baby wrench that nobody knows how to use because it just hurts your hands. U-Haul, no experience driving a large truck? Good luck. <laughs> we'll rent to anybody. But the thing I love about the book of James is James is not trying to sell you anything. James is being extremely honest about what our Christianity and what our faith is about. He's not trying to sell Christianity to you. If anything, he's being very real, very honest about our faith. It doesn't say anything like, trust Jesus and you'll be rich. Or if you love Jesus, you'll never get sick. Or follow Jesus and nothing will ever go wrong. Now, we'd like to believe that sometimes, but those aren't honest slogans. As a matter of fact, Jesus, what did he tell us? He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus was always honest to us about what Christianity would mean to us, that it wouldn't be easy that it was a narrow path, that sometimes it would be hard. You're going to have to make hard choices, but you're following the way that leads to life. That's why he said, yes, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. Why? Because I have overcome the world. And so if you look at James chapter one, starting with verse one, James addresses the book to believers scattered all throughout the Roman empire. And why are they scattered? Because they're being persecuted. The believers at this time, first century, are being persecuted, mocked, killed, tortured, beaten. They were going through what Jesus said, trouble. But James, he doesn't say, it's okay. Follow Jesus and all this pain will go away. No, what James says to us is, it's okay. God's with you, so suck it up and act like it. So James is a real honest book, and it gets real practical about what it means to be a Christian. In a lot of ways, it's a book about Christianity and everyday life. So over the next six weeks, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the book of James. Now, we can't get into every single verse of the book of James. I originally outlined the series to teach through the entire book, and it would have been 12 weeks, and I'm like, I'm too ADD. I can't do that. You guys can't do that. So that's why we have this Jim's Jim supplement, the little bookmarks that you sat on. And so you will have the opportunity during the week to go deeper, to study the entire book of James, because there's a lot in there. And James was almost like, hey, I get one book of the Bible. 
I got a lot to say, so I'm going to put it all in there. He's like, he was my brother after all. Fun fact, I don't know if you knew that. James was Jesus' half-brother, but he never brags about it. As a matter of fact, he does the exact opposite. In verse 1, he addresses the book to all the believers who are scattered, and then he, as he entitles himself, he says, I, James, I'm the one who's writing this book, as a servant of Jesus. He says, I'm a slave. That's what other translations say, a slave to Jesus. Now, he didn't always see himself that way. As Jesus was starting his ministry, James and his brothers, they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Look at this verse in John 7. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. Well, now that makes sense because, you know, if you leave church today, you pick up the phone, call your brother and sister, you try to convince them that you're God. See how well that conversation will go for you. They'll be like, did you get kicked in the head at church? Like, what's going on? Uh, do I need to get you committed? And in the same way, so Jesus now, all of a sudden, he starts his public ministry. He's the son of God. He's the Messiah. And James is like, whoa, 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 whoa. son of God? He's the son of Joseph and Mary. That's my brother. Like, I grew up with him. We, we built things together. We, we, we played baseball together. He was terrible at baseball. He couldn't even hit a curveball. I saw him go potty in his pants. He is not the son of God. He is my brother. What is he talking about? But Paul tells us something in 1 Corinthians 15. It says that after Jesus is resurrected, it specifically says that Jesus makes a special appearance. He, he makes a visit with James and all of the other apostles and disciples. So it specifically mentions that he goes to visit James because he didn't believe. And not only did he not believe, but he saw Jesus die. Mary was right there. She saw Jesus died. It's game over. You were on a cross. They took you off the cross. They put you in a tomb. That's it. And then all of a sudden, three days later, here he is right in front of me. He's seen it with his own eyes. He is alive. I don't know how you did it because you were really bad at baseball, but you defeated death. And so you are who you said you are. You did what you said you were going to do. You are the son of God. You see, the resurrected resurrection changed everything. So yeah, he was my brother, but now he's my Lord. He's my savior and I'm his servant. And as he writes this book, he's letting us know that, hey, this, what we believe in, this Christianity thing, it's real and it's worth it no matter what the cost. And we know from church history that James, he put his money where his mouth was. He actually believed that because church history tells us that James died a martyr's death in Jerusalem. He was actually pushed off the high point of the temple, and when he fell to the ground, he must have been a hardy man, he did not die, and so a mob ran over and beat him to death. And as he was being beaten, church history tells us he prayed for those attacking him. Now, all of that adds a little bit of context and a lot more weight to these words now in verse 2. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, Consider it an opportunity for great joy, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete. Other translations of the Bible say your faith will be made mature, needing nothing. So troubles will come, and when they do come, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Because the trouble, the testing, it's refining you. It's making you stronger. It's making you better. It's making you mature. This is kind of in part a little bit of what we talked about last week, how we were made to push through the storm, rise above the storm because we have eagle wings. That's how God designed us. He, he gave us the ability with the power of the Holy Spirit underneath us to rise above, to reach new heights. And that's what trouble affords for us is this opportunity to be better to be stronger, to mature. And so James continues. He's saying, as you find yourself in trouble, then look at verse five. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. Now that seems kind of obvious that when we're in trouble or when we need wisdom, we should turn to God. But it's amazing how often when we find ourselves in need, we'll turn to anybody but God. We'll oftentimes go to lots of different sources to get wisdom. Maybe it's TikTok. Maybe it's BuzzFeed. Maybe it's your idiot friend. And they're like, do you, do what feels right. Do what makes you feel good. Do what makes you happy. Yay, right? Like as if that advice is really going to help you do anything. And no wonder we feel stuck sometimes. But 
Often what happens is we'll turn to these worldly ideas, but these worldly ideas will only compound our worldly problems. And so the reason we should, we should go to God is that when tests, troubles, and temptations come, you will be tempted not to. You're going to be tempted to go anywhere else but God, to turn your back on him, to quit, to run away. Maybe in part because we bought into a bad slogan somewhere. This idea that, oh, trouble came into my life. I thought if I followed Jesus, no trouble would come. I thought if I followed Jesus, all my pain would go away. I thought if I followed Jesus, all the fear or the anxiety or the doubt would go away. Wait a minute. I still feel fear. I still have doubt. But we bought into a bad slogan because once again, that's not the life that Jesus invited us into. But what happens is then we get disappointed. And when we're disappointed or mad, we're tempted to turn our back on God. Like I said, to quit, to run away from him, to go look for life in other sources. And that's how sin is born into our life. Because what sin is, is it's trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. Sin is trying to meet a legitimate need in an illegitimate way. So let's say you have a need in your life, or maybe you have some hurt in your life or a pain in your life, but instead of turning to God, we turn to the bottle. Because we think the bottle's going to give us what we're looking for, or at least numb the pain. So often what happens is we'll turn to things that don't provide for us the life that we want. If anything, it, it provides for us more bondage. It leads to a life of death, which we're going to talk about here in a second, as opposed to freedom and life. And so James is warning us that when we give into temptation, it's going to rob you of the life that you want to have. It's going to rob from you the life, the dreams that God has for your life. And so here's the passage I want us to focus on for the rest of our time today. James 1, verse 12. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So James is saying, watch out for the temptation that may sneak into your life. And if you think about it, on any given day, think of all the temptations that we will face. Maybe the temptation to stay in bed because the night before you gave into the temptation to watch Netflix all night. Or maybe you gave into the temptation to eat an entire sleeve of Thin Mints and so you had sugar sweats and couldn't go to sleep. And by the way, Girl Scout cookies, their honest slogan should be guilty pleasures, should it not? <laughs> Or maybe you're tempted to yell at your spouse in the morning or, or yell at a sibling because you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You change the baby or you take out the trash because you're tempted to be lazy or maybe you're tempted to be selfish or in a bad mood. And so on the way out, you're tempted to kick the cat because maybe you're just mad you're the type of person who owns a cat in the first place. <laughs> don't buy it. Uh, don't kick the cat. Don't do that. Maybe we're tempted to, to lose patience with a coworker or a classmate because they're an idiot who can't do anything right because you've bought into the temptation that you've got it all figured out because it's the temptation of pride. Or maybe we're tempted to repeat that juicy story of our neighbor's misfortune because the temptation of, of gossip weirdly makes ourselves feel better in a weird, twisted way about ourselves. Or maybe you're at the coffee shop and you're tempted to flirt with that good-looking or attractive person in line because you need a different type of pick-me-up apart from the cup of coffee. Maybe you're tempted to spend money on what we can't afford because you've already bought into the temptation that you need to keep up appearances or an image. Maybe you're tempted to send a text we shouldn't send or not forgive someone we should. And maybe then you're tempted to feel all this guilt. And so you're tempted to have one more drink than you know you ought to as the night winds down. And all of this could just be called Monday. All these temptations in one day will face all these temptations, some big, some small, all fighting against us to become the type of person that we want to be, the type of person that God wants us to be. Now, I want you to notice something from James, where he says temptation comes from, because this may be surprising us, because sometimes people will say, well, this is just the way God made me. You know, this is just the type of person I am. But that's not true, because God never tempts anyone. Right? Now, your sin nature is a part of that, and your sin nature is working to corrupt you or pull you away from God, but God didn't make you that way. Or people will say, well, I don't know why or how I did that, and they'll try to separate themselves from whatever choice or whatever temptation they've given into, and they'll say, well, the devil made me do it. Now, there is a real enemy, and he is very good at advertising. 
He's really good at writing slogans because Jesus told us he is the father of lies. But you're the one who bought the product. You see, he may make the neon sign, but you get to decide if you walk through the door because James tells us that temptation comes from our own desires. You saw it. You wanted it. You gave into it, and then it got into you. In the 1970s, there was a study done by Stanford University, a pretty famous study. It's now been replicated and done in lots of different contexts, and it involved putting some marshmallows in front of kids. Maybe you've heard of this study. And so they would put a marshmallow in front of a kid, put the kid in a room for 15 or 20 minutes or so with a promise that if they could delay gratification, if they could resist the temptation of the marshmallow in front of them, then as their reward, they would get two marshmallows. So there's a church that redid this, and I want you to take a look at this video that they did a few years back. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> Oh, that video is adorable, isn't that? Could you feel the tension these poor kids were experiencing as they were trying to resist what was right in front of them? And that kind of shows you how temptation works, how hard it is to resist something, whatever it is, when it is in front of you, because you stare at it, you begin to long for it, smell it, give it a little kiss. The one kid gave a little kiss. It's just so funny. The one little girl who nibbles all of it and leaves the core, maybe no one will notice that I nibbled most of it. But you see, those little nibbles, they lead to big bites. And big bites can lead to lost rewards. And from what I could tell, maybe only one kid fully resisted that kid at the end who shoved both in his mouth. But in the real study, only about 10%, 10% of the kids were able to resist the temptation because that's how temptation works. When it's in front of you, it taps into your desires. And when you begin to focus on it, it begins to entice you. And as it entices you, it begins to drag you away. Other translations of the Bible, when it talks about being enticed and dragged away, it talks about being lured. So you get this image of like a hook and bait and bait being put out for you that something's trying to lure you away. Now, if I put a marshmallow here at the end of this, so give me one second, and I were to dangle this marshmallow in front of somebody's face. So here we go, right? <laughs> And I was like, ooh, here you go. Take the marshmallow. Do you want it, right? Now, for many of you, you'd be like, it's a marshmallow. What are you talking about? I don't want the marshmallow. For it to be tempting, it has to be alluring to you, right? It has to be something that you want. That's why if in the study, they would have put a can of sardines in front of the kids. 
I think that percentage from 10% would have went a lot higher because most of the kids wouldn't have been able to resist the temptation. And so for many of you are like, well, I'm not tempted by whatever it is that you're talking about, Greg. I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, so these marshmallows, whatever it is that you're trying to get us to focus on does nothing for me. Well, here's the reality. Yeah, maybe the marshmallow itself does nothing for you, but all of us have an it. All of us has something that tempts us. For you, it might be money. If I dangled money, the opportunity to get more money, maybe an opportunity to cheat on your taxes, nobody would know about it. Maybe an opportunity to do something a little bit dishonest, to get a little bit extra, right? Whatever it is, you're like, woo, now that, that's enticing to me. That, that's a little bit more alluring. So for you, you're like, you know what, though, I'm not a greedy person. Money does nothing for me. So for you, maybe you're like, okay, so it's not money, but maybe it's sex or pleasure. Or like, you know what, that's, that's it for me. You know, I'm just, I'm just looking out to have a good time. And if I can just have a good time, that's really all I want. It's all it's going to fulfill my life. So I'm just out there looking at whatever will give me pleasure in the moment, which for some of you then you're like, no, that's not it. That's, that's silly talk. Maybe for you it's some type of addiction that you have, an addiction to a bottle, an addiction to a pill, addiction to pornography, and you know it's kind of robbing from you, but you've kind of come to cohabitate with it because you're like, oh, it's never going to go away. It just is what it is. The reality is all of us have something. I don't know if you remember the old ad campaign from eBay. eBay had a pretty famous ad, campi- ad campaign. It said, whatever it is, you can find it on eBay. Well, the idea on eBay is that there's something there that you could buy that would be enticing to you. As a matter of fact, this is maybe the dumbest thing that I saw on eBay as I knocked that over. This is a grilled cheese sandwich. Look at this. Grilled cheese sandwich. There's an image of the Virgin Mary on it. This sold for $28,000. Somebody was like, I saw it, and I had to have it. Well, once again, this is how temptation works in our life. Whatever it is for you, it gets dangled in front of your face. And you're like, ooh, that does look good to me. I need that. That's enticing. That's alluring. And we begin to compromise who we want to be or who God made me to be because we will sacrifice a lot to get it, whatever it is in our life, because all of us have some version of an it. And the danger about the it in our life is it has in it a hidden hook. There's something attached to it that's there that will try to trap you, something there that will try to snag you. And what inevitably happens is when it hooks us, when it snags us, we don't like the outcomes that come from that. That's why James says that it, whatever your it is, whatever your temptation is, it gives birth in your life to death. There's an author by the name of George Sweetie, and he writes about a family vacation that he took to the Niagara Falls, and it was springtime. And the ice on the river was beginning to melt, and they were watching the ice rush down the river and go over the falls. And there were seagulls that were swooping in, and there were dead fish that got lodged inside of the ice. And so they were trying to pry the the dead fish from the blocks of ice before the ice went over the edge of the falls. Well, one bird got really close to the edge of the falls, and all of a sudden it opened up its wings and began to take off. And as it took off, the block of ice was attached to its feet It began lifting the block of ice out of the water, but it seemingly held on too long. Well, what had happened is the bird got frozen to the block of ice, and the weight of it took the seagull into the abyss, to which the author said, the finest attractions of this world become deadly when we become attached to them. They may take us to our destruction if we cannot give them up. I think all of us, if we're honest, we know what it's like to give in to a temptation, to give in to an it and feel like it's robbing from us, feel like it's leading us to death or feel like we went into a free fall. We shouldn't have said what we said, but we said it and it's out there. But that relationship, it's dead now. We shouldn't have cheated on that application or cheated on that test. It's too late. That opportunity, it's dead now. We shouldn't have lied to our boss, but we did. And that promotion, it's dead now. And I think that's why James reminds us that there's a reward if we don't give in. He says there is a crown of life for those who endure, who resist temptation. I think this is both eternal and temporal. 
Because if temptation leads to death, yes, this can lead to an eternal death, you fully giving into sin and walking away from Christ, but it also leads to a, a temporal death where we feel the loss, the free fall, the, the pain, the death that comes in from giving into temptation. I think the opposite is also true, that if we overcome whatever it is in our life, we overcome the temptation, then we thrive. We feel life now. We get the victor's crown. You didn't succumb to that addiction. You overcame that addiction. You are better for it. You're stronger for it. You're healthier for it. You didn't go along with the crowd. You didn't do what they did. They all got in trouble for it. They went down the wrong path. You found yourself being able to walk from it in the clear, and you feel the life that comes from that. Even that little kid in the video, the church that made the video, said that the little kid had predetermined, the one who ate the two marshmallows, he had predetermined that if he could wait, as his reward, he would shove both marshmallows into his mouth. So he pictured the reward. And picturing the reward, knowing that there was a crown that awaited him, it made it easier for him to beat the temptation. And that's what James is trying to tell us, that there's a reward. There's a crown of life, both eternal and temporal. But you have to have a vision for your life greater than the now. You have to have a vision for your life and who you want to be and who God is calling you to be greater than the temporal, greater than just buying into that moment, whatever it is. But if you get a vision for something greater, you understand that there's a reward, then it makes it easier to fight. And I think James wants to make temptation easier for us to fight. And that's why he gives us what is really the anatomy of temptation. He's breaking it down for us. He's giving us the playbook. He's saying, hey, you want to beat it in your life? You want to beat temptation in your life? Let me give you the playbook. Let me show you. You got to study the game film. Let me show you how it works. And so roughly in this passage, I see five plays or five parts of temptation. So let's break down temptation's playbook really fast. It starts with desire. It looks good to me. I want it. And the more you focus on it, the more desire builds, which leads to enticement. My will weakens as I debate it, ponder it, or focus on it, which leads to being dragged away. And this is when you have a strong imagination of self-gratification that will come from it. You begin to fantasize about it. You begin to see pleasure that will come from it, how it will make your life better, at least in that moment, which leads to sin. I do it. And now I feel trapped by it, which leads to death. I feel the pain of it. I don't like the pain of it. I don't like the consequence of it. I wish I didn't do it. And regardless of what your it is, because all of us have an it, the playbook's exactly the same. It operates the same way in your life. And so if you can understand how it works, then you can begin to fight it. So what can we do about it? Well, let me read one verse to you and give you a few plays that you can play back to fight it in your life. And this is a verse from Paul in Corinthians, and this is a great supplement to the verse in James that we just read. 1 Corinthians 10, very famous verse about fighting temptation, starting with verse 12. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. So your first play, the first thing you can understand about temptation is to be aware of it. Be aware of it. I want you to notice that both James and Paul said, when you are tempted. They didn't say if you were tempted. They both said when you are tempted because temptation is like Thanos from Avengers. I am inevitable. It will happen. doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. doesn't matter how mature you are. It is inevitable. To which, to which Rick Warren says this, many Christians are frightened and demoralized by tempting thoughts, feeling guilty that they aren't beyond temptation. They feel ashamed just for being tempted. This is a misunderstanding of maturity. You will never outgrow temptation. You can't outgrow it. You can only choose to overcome it. But this is kind of one of those lies from the enemy that will creep into our head. Oh, you're tempted? You already have sinned. Oh, you're tempted? You've already done it. 
You're tempted, you're already a bad person. You're tempted, you're already guilty. You see, the temptation makes us think we've already did it sometimes. The temptation makes us feel like we've already sinned, but that's not true. To be tempted is not to sin. And as a matter of fact, I would make the argument that your awareness of temptation and your desire to fight the temptation is actually a good thing because it's a sign of growth. It's a sign of calling. Look at Jesus. As Jesus was starting his public ministry, he went out, fasted, and went out into the wilderness for 40 days, and he faced extreme temptation. Jesus, the Son of God, intense temptation. So the enemy came. Why did the enemy come? Well, because he was afraid of the greatness that was about to break forth. He knew the potential, the calling, what God was trying to do through Jesus in this world, so the enemy noticed. So the temptation, in lots of ways, was a a compliment. So in the same way, if you're becoming aware of your temptations, well, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of growth. That's a sign of calling. That's a sign of your mission. That's a sign of you having a purpose. If you're not aware of your temptations or you're just succumbing to them, you've already lost. The enemy doesn't need to waste time with you, right? You're already giving into it. But if you begin to fight it, whatever it is, you're beginning to resist it. You're beginning to stand up. The enemy is going to take notice because God's working in you. And so that's a compliment. But you have to be aware that all of us, Every single one of us have an it. There is something that's trying to cut your legs out from underneath you and rob from you the life you want to have, which leads to the second thing we need to be aware of. You aren't alone in it. You aren't alone in it. That's why Paul says your temptations that you're facing, they're no different from what others experience. Well, this always comes with another lie. Because whenever you're facing it in your life, whatever is tempting you, we think that we're extremely different. We think we're the only one who's facing what we're facing. And that brings with us a bunch of shame, a bunch of sorrow, a bunch of regret. We're like, man, if somebody else knew what I was going through, if they knew the thoughts I was having and they knew the struggle I had, oh, they wouldn't even want to talk to me. They wouldn't want to be my friend. They would think I'm gross. They would think I'm evil. They'd think I'm a bad person. Because we think we're the only one. And so what do we do when we we think we're the only one? We tend to hide. We isolate. Well, the best way to hunt an animal is to separate it from the pack. And so the worst lie you can believe about it is that you're alone in it. They redid the marshmallow test a few years back. Like I said, they've kind of done a few different iterations of it. They added a test group. And in some of the rooms, they actually put two kids with two marshmallows together as opposed to one kid by themselves with a marshmallow. We already see where this is going, right? The two kids who were together in a room were, by a large percentage, much more likely to resist the temptation or to delay the gratification because they could rely upon one another. That's one of our, why one of our value statements here at St. Line Church is we are better together. You weren't made to do faith alone. We need each other. So the best thing you can do with your it is expose it. It's the, the second it comes out of your mouth to another person, it immediately begins to lose grip in your life. It immediately begins to lose power in your life because it, whatever your it is, it thrives in the dark. So if you want to cut the legs out from underneath it in your life, bring it to the light. If you expose it to the light, it loses power in your life. Lots of different ways we can do this. You can go to a trusted friend, right? They love you, a family member. They love you. They're there for you. They're not going to shun you or shame you. You can go to an accountability partner, get an accountability partner. You can go to your small group, talk to your small group. If you don't have a small group, you should get in a small group. That's part of the reason we have them here at church. You can go to a counselor. Sometimes whatever our temptations are, they're nuanced. And you need a little skill and wisdom on how to deal with it. You can go talk to a counselor. But what you should never do is keep it in the dark. Just fight it on your own. Bring it to the light. The third play we have in our playbook is to know that there's always a way out from it. There's always a way out from it. I heard a story about a little boy at a grocery store. And there was an open box of cookies. And this little boy was just staring at this open box of cookies, salivating lips smacking, hunger pangs in his belly. A grocer notices this from afar and walks up to the little boy. Hey there, young man. What are you up to? Nothing. Nothing? Well, it looks like to me you're trying to take a cookie. Well, you're wrong, mister. I'm trying not to. (laughs) I think most of us are trying not to. We don't want to give in to it. We don't want to give in to our temptation. But dang, them cookies do look good, don't they? 
Them cookies, they have a way of enticing us, dragging us away, luring us. The bait has been set and it pulls us in. So what do you need to do with the cookies? This is that's so profound, guys. Oh, you'll never hear wisdom like this ever in your life. So just be ready for it. Here's what you do. Get away from the cookies. You get away from the cookies. You run from the cookies. You don't look at the cookies. You don't ponder the cookies. You don't debate if I should take a cookie. You just get away. This is what Joseph did in the Old Testament when Potiphar's wife came and tried to seduce him. Did he debate it? Did he negotiate? Did he ponder it? No. What did he do? He forest gumped that sucker. He just started running. He got away. You just get away from the cookies. And it gets a lot easier to get away from temptation if you don't stare at it. You think about those kids in that video, in no other context would they be tempted by a marshmallow other than it being right in front of their face. The point, and I'll tell you this, the point at which you begin to debate it, you've already begun to lose. The point at which you begin to negotiate with it, you've already begun to lose. But if you predetermine, usually in times when you're not in front of it, you will set yourself up to win. You have to make choices ahead of the tempting times. I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to hang out with them. Whatever that choice is, and that makes for you a way out. I heard a friend of mine talking about working out and the discipline of working out. People will come up to him and say, man, you must be so disciplined to work out as much as you do. And you must have a, a ton of willpower. And he said, actually, no, I've just taken the willpower or the choice away. So instead of debating each morning when I get up, hey, am I going to work out at six in the morning? I just don't give myself the choice. I've just determined I'm the type of person that does work out at six in the morning. He's taken the choice away, which means there's no debate. There's always then the way out if you understand that you can take the choice, you can predetermine the choice, you can make whatever choice you want to, that you are empowered to do so. And then the last point is that God understands it. God gets it. And we hear that and we're like, okay, sure. But he doesn't get this. Not what I'm struggling with. Not what I'm going through. Well, look at this verse in Hebrews. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest, talking about Jesus, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Jesus was tempted, it says right there, in every way, just like you and I, yet he did not sin, which means we have a God who understands. He gets it. He gets you and I. He gets the struggle. He gets the temptation. He knows what it's like to be lured and yet to resist. You see, he had a choice. And he said, no, you know, I think we have such a, an easy time in today's modern age understanding the deity of Christ, right? Yes, God went to the cross, died for the forgiveness of our sins, resurrected three days later. Awesome. Yeah, worship him, son of God. We forget about the humanity of Christ that he was tempted. And for it to have been tempting to him, that means he had to have wanted at times to not do what he was supposed to do. So you think about the cross for a second. Do you not think that he did not want to die on a cross? That he was, as a matter of fact, in the Garden of Gethsemane, we see him agonizing with his father. He's praying, he's saying, Dad, there's gotta be another way. I don't want to go die on a cross this weekend. This is not really on my agenda. I don't want to do this. But we know he did not give in to the temptation. He overcame the temptation because he had already made his choice. So he was able to resist the temptation to not do what he was supposed to do because he had already predetermined he was going to go to the cross. And not only did he predetermine that he was going to go to the cross, but he was aware of the reward that waited him. He was aware of the crown of life, his victor's crown, that not only would he defeat sin, but he would defeat death 
and that every tongue would confess and every knee shall bow, right? Proclaiming that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He was aware of the crown, which it made it so much easier for him to not give in to any temptation. Well, in the same way, you and I, we are promised a crown, the crown of life. It is worth it to resist it. So think about your it. What is it trying to rob from you? Is it trying to take your family from you? Is it trying to take your friendships from you? Is it trying to take your career from you? Is it trying to take your dignity from you? Is it trying to take your self-worth from you? It is trying to rob you of something. Now compare that to the reward. What Jesus is trying to give you, life, hope, endurance, a future, strength, and the reward compared to what it's trying to take from you will give you the focus and the grace, the ability to overcome whatever it is in your life. And so here's how I want to end today. I want us to come to the altar. Let's just get before Jesus. And, and maybe that starts with us confessing it. Maybe some of us have never confessed it to him. And that can start right now. You can just say it. And I'll tell you, you want to talk about freedom. When you get it off your chest, you give it to the Lord and begin to confess it. Confess your sin. Confess your temptation. Confess whatever it is. Give it to him. Then ask for his wisdom. Invite his wisdom in as you come to the altar to help you fight it, to overcome it. Ask him to show you the way out from it. However that is for you, whatever your it is, there is always a way out. But just know that he understands. And so we can come boldly before his throne. We can find mercy and help because he is a God of grace. So regardless of what all of us need, we're going to come to the altar. And you know what we're going to find today? Grace. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you so much that you are willing to not give in to temptation that you overcame temptation, that you went to a cross, you died for us, both to give us freedom from our sins and our temptation, but the promise of life, a hope, both temporal and eternal life. Help us knowing that you roadmap for us what it looks like, have that same vision and future for who it is that you're calling us to be, where we can come now boldly before your throne of grace. Help give us the strength to confess it, whatever it is. Give us the wisdom we need to fight it. Give us the discernment to know what it is. Help us see the way out from it. But for everybody in this room, where regardless, Lord, of what our it is, I pray everybody in this room feels a healthy dose of grace right now in the name of Jesus. We pray.